Um, our first talk is going to be by Dr. Joseph Perloff. Hopefully I don't have to introduce him to anybody. I think his reputation precedes him. So I'll merely say that Dr. Perloff is an incredible clinician, researcher, and for me personally, an incredible role model and mentor. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Joseph Perloff, who will be talking about the EKG. Dr. Abelhausen, out of the kindness of his heart, uh, chose the most antiquated speaker to speak about the most antiquated topic, the electrocardiogram. It reminds me of the name Mary. Uh, it was just a, a very simple name, uh, the electrocardiogram. Think of the glorious past. At any rate, I'll try to animate it so it becomes an item of more than casual interest. The electrocardiogram in adult congenital heart disease. I shall focus on five aspects of this topic. First, the history of the electrocardiogram. Two, vector cardiography. Three, unusual or unfamiliar forms of common arrhythmias. Four, the long QT interval. And five, the signal averaged electrocardiogram. The history of electrocardiography. Many brilliant minds contributed to the development of electrocardiography as a clinical science. <clears throat> the early history, 1900 to 1945, was dominated, indeed animated, by Professor Willem Eindhoven in the Netherlands, Sir Thomas Lewis in England, and Frank N. Wilson in the United States. These pioneers laid the foundation for modern electrocardiography. The dignified Professor Willem Einhoven, uh, shown on your right uh, with his string galvanometer, a remarkable device that he conceived both uh, in, uh, that he developed both in concept and execution. In the 1924 Nobel Prize in Physiology of Medicine was awarded to Willem Einhoven for his discovery of the mechanism of the electrocardiogram. Sir Thomas Lewis, cardiologist and clinical scientist, he was a unique combination, at that time at least, of the cardiologist and the clinical investigator. He established atrial fibrillation as a clinical entity. That might seem uh, commonplace, but at that time, no one quite knew what atrial fibrillation was or how it was uh, controlled. Frank N. Wilson introduced the modern era of electrocardiography. He demonstrated negativity in the ventricular cavity and activation from endocardium to epicardium. Vector cardiography. <clears throat> I might say that one of the earliest centers of vector cardiography was the old Mount Sinai Hospital in New York where I was a house officer. Arthur Grishman conceived the idea, a brilliant German refugee, and he developed the first uh, workable vector cardiograms. The person that influenced me most uh, was Robert Purvis Grant. Uh, vector cardiography, spatial vector cardiography, clinical echocardiographic interpretation. Uh, Dr. Grant was at the NIH when I was uh, a youngster, and uh, he came to the NIH every Thursday afternoon and spent the entire, well, three or four hours reading unknown electrocardiograms. I was both fascinated and impressed, impressed by the capacity of this man to interpret the electrocardiogram not only clinically, but to draw correct diagnostic conclusions. And he did so by putting them in the vector cardiographic concept. In other words, he converted the clinical oh dear. he converted the clinical electrocardiogram uh, into its vector cardiographic equivalent. In other words, what he would do is take the 12 lead electrocardiogram and retrace it according to the sequence of activation, as if it were a vector cardiogram. He published a 98-page book with Harvey Estes at the NIH. Purvis and uh, Grant and Estes, uh, I virtually memorized the book. 
Let's now look at unfamiliar or unusual forms of common arrhythmia. The sinus arrhythmia, heart rate variability. Uh, it's common enough, but there are certain things about it that um, are not uh, clear enough. For example, sinus arrhythmia can only occur if the atrial septum is intact. I must say I'm very pleased that I discovered this so long ago that I can't remember when. But I remember seeing a patient with uh, an atrial septal defect. And uh, immediately after operation, virtually out of the operating room, there was a striking heart rate variability of sinus arrhythmia. And I'd examined the patient a few hours before the defect was closed and the uh, sinus arrhythmia was not present. Uh, sinus arrhythmia can only occur if the atrial septum is intact. Irrespective of where the atrial septal defect might be, uh, the uh, sinus arrhythmia will not occur uh, in the presence of an atrial septal defect. It is minimal or absent with an atrial septal defect. Uh, here's an example. Atrial septal defect, no sinus arrhythmia, normal sinus rhythm, perfectly regular. And here, literally, uh, in the recovery room after operation, immediately after the defect was closed, uh, there was a striking uh, atri uh, uh, sinus arrhythmia when the atrial septal defect is closed. The long QT interval, uh, this has fascinated uh, people for years, and uh, I'd like to show you uh, an unusual um, a manifestation. Uh, the Lang-Nielsen syndrome, how many of you have heard of the Lang-Nielsen syndrome? Uh, not many, it tends to date people who uh, uh, were interested in syndromes of uh, peculiar nature. Uh, the Lang-Nielsen uh, Lang, uh, syndrome is an autosomal res recessive disorder characterized by congenital deafness, shown here, QT interval prolongation, ventricular tachycardia, syncope, and sudden death. Uh, it's, it's interesting that the same Robert Purvis Grant discovered it because he owned a Dalmatian coach hound. Uh, Dalmatian coach hounds may look alike, uh, but some dogs drop dead on the hunt because of canine long QT uh, uh, Lang Nielsen syndrome. You can't tell which is which, but one of those dogs uh, with the Lang Nielsen syndrome will drop dead on the hunt. Uh, coupled bodies. Uh, this, I remember seeing these uh, conjoined twins, and uh, I saw them only after I had read the, or tried to read the electrocardiogram shown here. I couldn't figure this out. This is a coupled rhythm. There are two distinct rhythms, one here and one here. Uh, they have nothing to do with each other, and until I learned the cause of it, um, uh, the coupled bodies, uh, I didn't have any idea uh, what uh, they were. The signal average electrocardiograms uh, uh, signal average electrocardiogram. In the 1970s, Michael B. Simpson, who was one of my first fellows at the University of Pennsylvania, a cardiology fellow at Penn, developed the signal average electrocardiogram to detect slow conduction substrate of reentry. He succeeded in doing so, but he did it in ischemic heart disease. So once the substrate was identified, uh, there were too many substrates uh, for obliteration. So although the concept was fruitful, uh, it was not uh, applied. The signal average electrocardiogram identifies low amplitude potentials, the curved arrow below. At the end of the QRS complex, late potentials represent delay, these late potentials represent delayed ventricular activation and increased risk of reentrant monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. The signal average electrocardiogram, uh, in a study that I did with uh, Holly Middlecoff and Bill Stevenson in, uh, in uh, 2006, we reinvestigated and found that the signal average electrocardiogram was as valid today as it was when uh, uh, it was first identified. Ventricular tachycardia, electrophysiologic mechanisms of ventricular tachycardia. There are only three, reentry, automaticity, and triggered activity. 
Inducible sustained ventricular tachycardia is typically reentry and monomorphic, uh, which is shown here. Now, why do I make this point? Uh, substrate plus trigger. Reentrant substrates remain dormant unless activated, triggered. One of the reasons the signal average electrocardiogram was not used is because even if it were positive, uh, it didn't occur to us, at least at that time, that something had to trigger the mechanism, otherwise it would remain dormant. Uh, the overt expression of reentrant monomorphic ventricular tachycardia requires both a substrate, shown here, uh, and a trigger. The signal average electrocardiogram detects the substrate and severe pulmonary regurgitation serves as a trigger. Now this was a step forward because it was the first time that we understood why patients after uh, repair of fallows tetralogy that left them with severe pulmonary regurgitation dropped dead, had sudden death. In patients with a positive signal average electrocardiogram, slow conduction reentrant substrates are usually along the ventriculotomy scar. Now that is a useful proceed, that's a useful comment because they can be identified and obliterated. Reentrant substrates can be eliminated by radiofrequency ablation, shown on the lower left, uh, and surgical uh, revision of the ventriculotomy scar. I have focused on five aspects of this topic uh, in a brief comment of 15 minutes. The history of the electrocardiogram the vector cardiogram, unusual or unfamiliar forms of common arrhythmias, the long QT interval, and the signal averaged electrocardiogram. Thank you very much.